much. So this is our presentation on discussion forums, which um, there's been a little bit of chat about, and we're hopefully going to explain what they are good for. So my name's Karen, and I've got my colleague Janie here with you. And we're very grateful to Telseg for allowing us to present um, what we have been doing. And one of the reasons why is captured in this quotation here, the idea that if we work together, we get more feedback and interaction and we get a better whole. And certainly we've already taken into account some of the things that we've had um, originally, you know, in the in the presentation so far. Even though we're re-recording this again due to our technical difficulties, we'll still try to keep in mind what we've learned and we hope that we're going to learn from you too. So in today's um, presentation, we have a number of outcomes that we hope arise from this. And part of that, of course, is looking at our discussion forum and trying to understand, you know, how it can help to build a community of inquiry. Um, and we'll take you through all of that. And we'd also like to share that in a sequence of e-tivities. Um, and we'll be sharing not only our slides, but also some further information on the e-tivities uh, after the presentation so that you can see how everything flows together. All right, so for this first part, I'll pass over to Janie. Uh, and then I'll be back to talk about assessment of our forums in the latter half of the presentation. Janie, over to you. Thank you very much, Kerith. So just before we move on in the presentation, I think it's always important to acknowledge the context that we're working in because context can be so different. So in terms of what the programme is that we developed this sequence of activities for, it's an MSc in TESOL, which has 12 different pathways. Six pathways are aimed at on-campus students and six pathways are aimed at students who are studying from a distance. So our main aim was actually to somehow unite both learners studying from a distance and our learners on campus into um, a group, a community, and a community which shared inquiries. So why? Well, I suppose that our main motivation was the notion of the importance of context for teachers, and certainly um, for teachers on an MSc in TESOL. So one of the ideas was that through, the, through this community of inquiry, students would be able to access each other's um, actual teaching context because many of our distance learning teachers are full-time practitioners and they're widely distributed across the world so that we have students for example in Canada and then we have students all the way across to Japan and further to the east and so we thought it would be really interesting to use this as an affordance to think about how you can apply theory in different contexts and then see you know the extent to which that theory actually fits the context because much theory is developed in relation to one particular location or one particular set of cultural values uh, and we thought that this community of inquiry approach would offer a really interesting way of helping our students understand just how important context is but obviously when you're in a context it's often invisible and so this was a way of trying to help our students um, actually see their context and also see each other's context. How? Well, we decided that the most useful way to build this community of inquiry would be to join the students together through a discussion forum, which we hosted on our virtual learning environment. So before I move on to both our experience and frameworks that we found useful, I think it's worthwhile dwelling just for a second or two on some of the characteristics of a discussion forum because one of the purposes is now talk is to say, well, what are discussion for are good for? And I think it's important to think a little bit about what traits they have that you can actually exploit, the affordances that they have that you can exploit in your teaching. So the first characteristic, I think, of a discussion forum is its convenience. So students can study at a time which is appropriate for them. And equally, actually, this is also true of the people teaching by the discussion forum. So you have that flexibility around when you participate. I think a second characteristic of discussion forums 
is that they are a bit like a face to face seminar group, but it's possible for everybody to be speaking at once and yet to hear each other clearly. Um, related to that, I think that Kareth and I would both say that we have noticed that students' contribution patterns differ in an online forum compared to a face-to-face -face tutorial. I guess that many of you are familiar with that thing where you have a student who's a little bit quiet and they sit in the, the seminar group and you worry maybe the extent to which they feel connected with what that group is discussing. And one of the things we've discovered is that you maybe get a greater willingness to uh, willingness to communicate when the discussion is actually online and asynchronous. And this is maybe because students can read each other's posts and then rather than feeling this need to speak immediately, which you often do in a seminar context, students can think, they can go to the literature, they can reflect, they can ponder, and then they can shape their response and edit that response so that they feel a much greater control over both the knowledge that they're using and also the language that they're using. So I think that this is a really important affordance of a discussion forum. Um, I'd also add that there is an effect on a discussion forum because of this in terms of the student's ownership of the literature. Because they can go off and read once they are sort of interacting with somebody else's thoughts, I think that it allows them to integrate the literature far better into their own thinking. And, you know, I think this does promote this notion that students have ownership of the literature, which I'm going to return to later. So in terms of um, discussion forum scholarship, you often see the claim made that discussion forum lead to maybe um, a greater degree of reflection on the part of the participants and possibly also um, increased quality of reflection. And over the last two years, Kareth and I have had to assess a number of forum posts, hundreds of them, to be honest. And so far, we probably would say that the evidence that we've seen backs up that claim. We do notice that over time, students become far more able to reflect. Um, and that this reflection doesn't just relate to the discussion forum itself, but they seem to transfer this skill across to other areas of their learning experience. However, and I think this is possibly one of the most important aspects of a discussion forum, is that we get a shift in hierarchies of authority. We get a shift in hierarchies of control. So on a discussion forum, I would argue that the teacher, the tutor, the lecturer is no longer the sage on the stage, but is basically sitting in the wings. <laughs> and as a result of that, students are no longer, as they might do in a face-to-face -face seminar, sort of scanning your face, trying to work out what it is that um, you wish them to say. And so therefore, what they do is they turn to the literature, they turn to the ideas and engage far more with that. So um, maybe one of the most important characteristics that we've noticed is that through this ownership of the literature and through this ongoing online debate, which takes place over time, students possibly have a greater ability to synthesize because they're very often taking scholarship and applying it, really exploring it, seeing how the theory actually fits. And so this is one of our, um, maybe one of our main um, findings about the use of a discussion forum. It changes students' relationship with the literature. So ooh, moving on, my first top tip is that very often when we are bringing in new ways of studying, as we did do under the emergency shift to remote teaching, um, we're time pressurised, we are maybe energy pressurised as well. And so one of the things that we noticed in our own practice is just how helpful it is to go out to the literature that's already there and to actually use these frameworks both in the activity planning stage and then evaluating that draft of the e-planning or the activities planning stage because um, very often 
through applying these frameworks, you can see how to improve something fairly rapidly. And I think that's a quite a useful thing to have in the current days. So this is my absolute go to framework and it was produced by Jilly Salmon. It was the result of a, quite an extensive piece of action research that she carried out. And although this was published actually in 2000, I still go back to this as a sort of touchstone in terms of understanding students' experience in an online environment. So the most important thing I'd like to point out to you is that she, she divides the learning into five different stages. But I would say that the first three stages are all about collaboration, in our case on a discussion forum, in order to establish individual identities, individual students' identities. But stages four and five are where you move towards this community of inquiry. And so in these stages, the collaboration brings about collaborative knowledge construction. And so in our cases, students drew on each other's context to explore theory. There was a co-construction of knowledge that was going on. So what I'm going to do now is to try and apply this framework just to explain what we did. So the first of Jilly Salmon's stages is access and motivation, and this is incredibly important. So I think earlier today, um, people were talking about onboarding. So this is how we onboarded our students, if that's a verb. OK, so we used the discussion forum um, or the news forum, sorry, on our VLE. And before the students arrived, we started to send them out all sorts of information about their coming programme. And as part of this, we made available a series of videos and texts all about how to use technology. However, we found that the most successful way to actually induct students to various technologies that we use on the program was to embed the induction within certain events or sessions within orientation week. And so this helps students to conceptualize what a particular technology is useful for. And so they can actually bring it into their own communication and study practices. Moving on, the next stage is online socialization. So this is the stage where students develop an online identity and they also reach out to other participants on the discussion forum so that they have people to interact with. So um, at this stage, I shamelessly stole David Reed's brilliant Padlet activity which he uses on his uh, technology for EAP teaching uh, program. Um, so following very closely actually something I experienced as a student when I um, was on that program, we did the following. So we simply put up a Padlet and on the Padlet we posted a number of questions. Now you can't see the last question that we asked students to react to, but this was simply to post a photo that had some sort of importance for the participant. And so you can see um, in Kerith's post, which is the second one, you can see, for example, that students can like posts so they can interact that way, which is pretty sort of low cost. So this starts to bring in those students maybe who are a little bit um, anxious about communicating online. But as you'll see, there were eight comments on Kerith's post, and this is where things start to move into a sort of much more like a chat situation. People are talking about what they like, dislike, where they've been, what they've done, and students are beginning to develop that online identity. So uh, on the right hand side, you can see um, the first student to actually contribute. You know, here he is, he's introducing himself. He tells you what his name is, what you'd, he'd like you to call him and so on. And so here, very much evidence that students are establishing their online identities. Now, this year, when we did this um, activity during orientation week, within a couple of days, we felt we must have been quite successful. And our reason for thinking this was that the students contacted us and said, listen, you know, if we were actually studying face to face, we'd probably all catch up with each other down the cafe. But we can't do that at the moment. Is it OK if we set up a couple of student cafes, but online ones? And so one of our students very kindly set up two online cafes, uh, one using WhatsApp and another using Facebook. And so the students have a space which is just for them. 
staff aren't admitted and they're not welcome. And it's great for students to have that type of space to kick back in. So a very important part of the socialisation stage. In the next stage, Salmon talks about how we move towards information exchange. And so this is where we started actually inducting students to the discussion forum itself. So the first activity related to this was the students working through a Moodle book, which was a guide to using a discussion forum. Now, that might sound like sort of a technical guide that focused on things like etiquette or whatever, and that was a small element of the guide. But actually, our guide starts off with the principles that we use, the theories that we used to develop the TESOL programs. And so we had sections on things like um, communities of practice, because communities of practice are essential sort of guiding principle for us in the development of our master's programs. We talked about social constructivism and we explored the theories that underlay the type of learning that the students would be doing on the discussion forum. And we also talked a little bit about connectivism. And as Kerith will mention later, we talked also about um, how um, assessments are carried out and how we use Bloom and Bloom's taxonomy in order to develop our assessments. And this is an important point simply because we assessed participation, contribution to the discussion forum as part of our modules. And Kerr's going to talk a little bit about that later. So in the next stage, this is where we introduce students to a discussion forum and we ask them just a very, very simple question. How can you define a lesson? So possibly due to the COVID-19 situation at the moment, this led to a very, very sort of, um, there's a lot of energy around this discussion, lots of different ideas um, and people challenging maybe more conventional notions of what a lesson was. So um, at this stage, the students had a chance to interact um, and to share their ideas. And so they were talking about the different contexts in which they've studied and which they teach in order to explore this activity. And you'll see that we actually asked people to be creative, that they could contribute in many different forms. So we didn't just require them to necessarily post words. So they could, for example, use PowerPoints, they could record an audio, they could record a video. And what we did find was that the students did use varied formats in which to communicate their views of what a lesson is. Now, you might be thinking, OK, I'm an eap -er. How is this relevant to me? Well, you can imagine that if you change that question to how can we define a discipline? Actually, this task works very, very well for EAP. And I should say that Kerith and I have both learned from our practice on the TESOL programme and transferred this into our EAP practice. OK, so my next top tip is to be prepared for discomfort because as I said earlier there is this shift in authority and control hierarchies are flattened um, we're all equal participants and this can sometimes cause problems so I just want to raise an issue that we had in relation to the last of Jilly Salmon stages so in this stage students are encouraged to reflect on what they've learned from contributing to the forum and then to think about how they can transfer this to other areas of their learning, both on the programme and beyond the programme. And we were co contacted by a student who felt that he had been very unfairly identified by a fellow student on the basis of his name and religious affiliation. So at this point, Kerith and I really did feel very uncomfortable. We had long discussions about what would be the right way to go. But we decided that we should stay true to this principle of not being a sage on the stage, but sort of, you know, being like more like a support network um, at the side of the room. So we contacted the student who felt that he'd been unfairly misidentified and tried to build his confidence to then engage with the other student, engage with the other student's ideas. And what we can say now, that student is in his second year on the programme. And he is possibly um, one of our most successful participants within the discussion forums. He feels very able to explore, to challenge, 
um, in the company of his colleagues. So I think that that sort of suggests that um, that the discussion forum may make us feel uncomfortable at times, but it can be a very, very positive experience for our students. So that's how we applied Julie Salmon's framework. But as, as I said earlier, it's really important to stay true to ourselves, to listen to our inner EAP teachers, EAP tutors or lecturers, however you define yourself. So I think that many of us had an experience that in the shift to emergency remote teaching, our institutions bombarded us with information about different technologies. And what was missing from that was something I think that as trained teachers um, made us feel uncomfortable. And that was the sort of loss of pedagogical purpose from the discussion. And so I think in many institutions, we felt that we were being introduced to all these new technologies, but we'd lost sight of how we could actually deploy them in our teaching to maximize their affordances. So I think that another top tip is that when you are designing a series or a flow of activities, just stay true to yourself, listen to your inner EAP or voice and think about what your purpose is, what is it you're trying to achieve and then think about what technology, what platform, what app to use. Now, as we saw during that time, there's a massive array of different choices that we have and it's helpful sometimes to have a means to select. And so this is maybe one of the most helpful um, frameworks that I found at the planning stage. So this is Carrington's reconceptualization of Bloom's taxonomy, but for an online world. And the way that you can use it, if you look towards the center, you can see um, different sorts of, um, I guess, um, pedagogical aims. And then through the inner circles, you can also see Bloom's verbs. OK, so as you're designing an activity, you can work through the, the different concentric rings from um, the inside going outwards. And that then helps you limit your choice of useful technologies um, and actually put more of your focus on the pedagogical aspect than just than on maybe selecting the technology. So I found this really, really helpful when I was planning a series of activities. So what I, I guess I'm meaning here is that I don't see discussion forum as an activity by itself. I would embed it in a whole flow of activities in order to make um, or in order to try and maximize student engagement. But having designed a flow of activities, I would then want to somehow evaluate. And at this point, I would turn to the Samir model. And if you look around the outside of the circle, Carrington has actually put this on the outside of the circle. OK, so to go into a little bit more detail about um, the Samir model. OK, so this basically divides up how we use the functionality of technology into two groups. We can enhance some type of task or activity, or we can transform it. So here, we can start off with S, this is the substitution stage, and I think this is where a lot of us found ourselves uh, when we did this sort of emergency shift into online teaching. And so we took something that had been planned for face-to-face -face delivery and we simply translated it as easily as we could into an online activity. So here, that doesn't really bring any sort of functional change, it doesn't really enhance the, the actual activity in any particular way. Then at the next stage, we've got augmentation. So augmentation, we can somehow improve the task, the activity, the flow of um, activities through some type of functional improvement. However, we're probably trying to aim for the second, sorry, the second set of levels. So we've got modification and redefinition. So sometimes we can, if we rather than translate a face to face activity to an online activity, but we actually start off seeing it as a flow of activities that are going to achieve a certain purpose. We're much more likely to be able to use the affordances of the technology to bring about some sort of quite significant task redesign. And then I think with time, this takes us to a redefinition stage where we can cast this flow of activities in a way that would be absolutely inconceivable if we were doing this in a face-to-face -face context. 
So that's the SAMA model. And as I say, Kerith and I found this very useful as a framework to apply when we had drafted a, a flow of activities. And just to think, OK, what, you know, have we really drawn on the affordances as much as possible? OK, and so this leads us to our fourth top tip, which is to apply assessment criteria. And at this point, I'm going to hand over to Kerith, who is going to talk you through how we used assessment criteria to motivate our students to participate in our discussion forum. Thanks very much, Janie. So, yeah, as we say, we want to apply criteria and you might be asking yourself the question of why. Um, so in the question of why, um, if we can move on to the next slide, what we have on the question of why is, as Mason had said, and as we stated in our abstract, that sometimes students don't participate as we would wish them to. Now, you may think, OK, isn't this a bit, you know, stick in the carrot and stick scenario um, to push them to participate because you're applying criteria. But the literature that we found um, actually showed that this could be a positive experience. And so what we did in terms of assessment was think about how um, our students might find the assessment challenging. And one of the things that we know about assessment is, you know, what is the difference in the gradings between, you can see here, we've got our 20 point scale, 20 to 17 is the highest category. You've got critical engagement. And then in the 16 to 14 category, you've got good engagement. Well, what's the difference? What does it mean? Okay, you've critically engaged here or you've got good engagement there. If we are going to put in this element and maintain motivation for our students, we felt it was very important to show them, to help them to understand what our expectations were. So this goes back to what Janie was saying when we were applying the framework. We wanted to promote. So we gave the students, after they'd finished reading about um, you know, uh, the idea of social constructivism, for example, and how a forum does that, um, we gave them practice away from any mark so that they could feel, you know, threat free, if you like. Um, so we give them a number of instructions. Um, this particular one is Janie and I discussing it at a classroom because we've got two models. Sometimes we discuss the classroom and sometimes we discuss a lesson and the definitions of both. And essentially, we we kick it off. So um, I, for example, write down what I think in relation to the, to the questions that I have set. And then Janie does the same. This time, of course, though, as I have started it off, she is able to respond to my response. And uh, later, if you want to come back to the slides, you can look at that in more detail. But the most important thing is, that we then identify what we've done well in each of those areas of participation on the forum. So on the left hand side is what I did. And on the right hand side is Janie, the excellent student uh, who <laughs> managed to get most of the things up there in the 20 to 17 category. So well done. Um, <laughs> yes, I, I really must read the instructions more carefully. Ironic as I created them, but there we go. Never mind. <laughs> but the idea is that through showing our own posts and through assessing our own posts and making that visible for the students, they get a better understanding of what we are expecting from them on the forum. They can then have a go and we can too, you know, give feedback to them in this non-threatening environment. But it's not enough to stand still. So our top tips um, number five is that you must be prepared to reframe. So initially, when we started our criteria um, journey and applying assessment criteria to the forum post, we started at the top here um, and we've taken this um, from Roberts. We were looking around to see what other people had done. We've got bibliography entry for that. And we wanted something that focused on the quality of our post. So we had to look at what was out there and then we've got um, the first of the boxes on this slide here. 
what happened was that the students were excellent and they followed um, and, and took to heart the practice they'd had and then applied this really well in their assessment on the forum. And so we had a number of students getting those top marks in the 17 to 20 box. So much so that the deans in looking at our evaluation said, for the second iteration, could you please come back to this and see how you would be able to split out the students who were receiving those 20. And what you might be able to see, um, you know, in, in the second part, um, although I think I've actually written the same thing twice, but in the second part, we're going to look a little bit more on the reflection side of things. And I think that's incredibly important. As Janie said, it's one of the affordances, you know, if you go right back to um, Jilly Salmon's ideas, and we need to make more of reflection. Now, in top tip number six, not only do you need to make sure you've got your criteria right and that you're moving towards everything that you wanted to evaluate in the first place, you need to ask the right so uh, in my original um, post on one of our um, forums, I asked the following question, and you can see here that I've got some bold. I asked students to comment on and describe. You'll be familiar or you can have a look at Bloom's taxonomy and you would notice that this is really sort of at the bottom of things. You're understanding and perhaps demonstrating some knowledge, but we're not moving far up the pyramid. So. Students, again, being great students, you know, go ahead and fill it out. But am I building a community of inquiry? You know, really asking them to, you know, do something more than just respond. And with those keywords, comment on and describe. And then I had in brackets, add a picture if possible. I'm afraid the answer to the question was no. <laughs> I didn't manage to build a community of inquiry, um, which is not good. So what I did next was go back to the literature on the community of inquiry. Remember what Janie and I said about use the frameworks that are there. And I looked at the work of Garrison and Orbo, and I interpreted what they were saying about building the community of inquiry and made this research tool for myself. So I took their main key points and put those on the left hand side and then for every task um, which was a forum task I tried to evaluate whether or not I had done the four things noted and as I've said already sometimes it was not so then having looked at those keywords I then had to reframe I had to rethink the question and that was what I did next coming up with a new set of instructions, which I very much hope will now move us towards um, augmenting and making the most of this being a discussion forum. So yes, we've got comment on, so we're starting off somewhere, but we're now asking for a comparison, so we're applying. And then I've asked them to actually engage with their peers' posts, which was the part that was perhaps missing in the first one. Um, and perhaps would have been there in the classroom, you know, more naturally, but I kind of missed putting that online. So now I've got that in there and then they have to evaluate and decide. So we're coming up Bloom's um, economy to that idea of evaluation and, and thinking about which scenario they would most like to experience. OK, so that brings us to our conclusions. And so what are forums good for? We've got our little diagram on the right hand side that, yes, we can build, you know, a community of inquiry. We can assess that community of inquiry and it helps us to build further. And so we go round and round. So this is what forums can give us. Um, we can build a learning community and we can assess that learning community, which perhaps in a classroom you wouldn't necessarily do without some effort. Um, you know, we could give a whole nother presentation again on seminars <laughs> and how easy it is um, to assess that live, as it were. But this is, as Janie has mentioned, a seminar on screen, essentially. We also note that forums are good for shifting the role 
for moving the teacher from the sage on the stage into the wings, as Janie talked about, um, and allowing the learner to come forward as the expert, as the one that has done the reading. So we're going to put up, as I say, um, a sequence of our e activities uh, onto the TELSIG website with their thanks and help. Um, but we hope that this has given you an idea of what we have developed and why we think that discussion forums could play a role. Janie, is there anything you would want to add? No, just that I do think that mm -hmm. um, very often people are scared of using discussion forums because they think that their students won't engage. Mm -hmm. And I guess just my concluding comment would be that if anything, we were shocked about the amount of engagement that we've had from our students but also the quality of engagement mm -hmm. from our students and I think if you're doing any work with literature doesn't matter whether it's um, TESOL literature or literature in the students discipline um, or literature simply related to a common theme for a, um, uh, an English for uh, general academic purposes type contacts, context. Um, I think that it does bring about this fundamental shift in how students relate to the literature. Um, and they do appear to feel much greater ownership of it when they have this experience of applying it to different contexts and to actually being able to explore it. They have some um, possibility for it to come out out of the printed or online medium and into their discussions. And I think that's a really exciting affordance which discussion for a bring. Yeah, great. Well, we do also have some questions that um, we were asked when we gave this the first time round, Janie. Um, yeah. But of course, have been lost due to the technical difficulties that we experienced. <laughs> um, however, I've got a few notes here and I think we'll just go through them. So one yeah. of the participants asked, um, if you could give some more detail on these teacher-free student cafes, could you comment more about what's been developed? So basically, at the end of our orientation week, um, a student wrote to me and said, listen, there's been a bit of discussion and we would really like the idea of setting up some cafes because, um, you know, it's important for students to have a space of their own. Mm. Um, and actually, when we um, started developing the um, MSC TESOL programmes, we discussed it as a group of uh, lecturers who were involved in the teaching team. Um, and I guess that I was highly influenced by a presentation that I'd seen um, given at a university by a student who basically said, can you just leave our social media alone? You know, mm. WhatsApp, Instagram, uh, Facebook, these are our spaces. We don't want you to be using them for teaching. Um, and so I was really pleased when the student emailed me and said, can we just set up our own cafes, our online cafes, please? And so she collected um, the uh, emails of different people. and She set up a WhatsApp group and a Facebook group. And I believe that they're very, very lively. And I think it's really important for students to have a social space. Don't you, Kareth? I think, you know, everybody needs a place to kick back. Yes. Definitely helps, um, you know, that idea of the socialisation. Mm. Yeah, definitely. OK, we've got other questions, haven't we? Yes. Yeah, so one of the questions related to what platform okay. um, we use for our discussion forum and also how frequently mm. our students post. OK, so, yeah, we were using Moodle. Uh, as that's our virtual learning environment. So you can set up a discussion forum on that. Um, so that's what we used. And in terms of frequency of participation, um, so this, I suppose, goes back to, well, at least I can talk about a, a particular module that I assessed on. Like maybe that's helpful here. Um, and then, Jamie, you can bring in your your thoughts on this as well but certainly on the module where we bring together the on-campus and distance learners together um, we had we required them to interact three times so an original post they then had to respond to somebody else's post and once that response was 
in on their original post they had to come back to that and reflect on that and what had that added and what had that you know generated in their minds so that should be three posts per student and at that point we had I think it was eight students on campus in the first semester Jane you'll keep me right here and I think we had 12 yes, distance yes. students at that time so that's a 20 so if we went for that that would be 60 you know posts if everybody had done everything that they were meant to do but in fact we got 95 posts just on that assessment forum alone because sometimes the conversation did go on and, and they were genuinely interested in answers and getting more readings and understandings from one another. So, um, yeah, I think, you know, frequency of participation surprised us in the sense that they went above and beyond our expectations. But for the assessment, we stuck to assessing what we had stated we would be assessing, which was the three posting. So, Janie, what would you add in terms of frequency, would you say? Well, one of the things that I did um, at the end of the first semester of um, using this discussion forum practice, um, I sort of mapped out student contribution. And it was quite interesting in terms of looking at the patterns. Mm. So one thing I noticed was that you do tend to get a sort of peak where students are contributing and they're really engaging with each other. So in the literature, it recommends that you sort of shut down the discussion because if students know there's an end date, mm -hmm. they're more likely to sort of, you know, hurry up and contribute. But one of the things I noticed, one of our students was ill at the time and had to take about three weeks out of her studies. And um, so she's very enthusiastic and engaged student. So when she came back, she actually then started contributing again to some of the um, uh, questions and tasks that she'd missed while she was ill and this sort of created a second little peak of mm -hmm. contribution so that was one thing that I noticed so although in the literature it tells you to sort of you know have an end date for the for that particular um, discussion in that case we found it sort of brought back into the community of inquiry a student who'd been temporarily um, sort of made to feel outside of it because she was too ill to participate so I thought that was quite interesting mm -hmm. um, and I suppose that, that, you know, you have these ongoing questions, don't you, Kareth? So, mm. you know, you get what it tells you in the literature and then you try out and you don't quite do it according to the literature. And then you find out, oh, there's actually quite interesting things happen. So I think that that's one of the things that I noticed. And then the other thing that I've noticed is this year we have greater participation than we had last year mm -hmm. during orientation week. So whether this is simply because we're a bigger community of inquiry, but even per student as a high number of postings so is this something to do with the students feeling you know that they could they could create their online um, cafes and things you know it's very difficult sometimes to work out what the different factors are um, but I think those are the sort of key points that I would probably pull out and so I suppose this leads quite nicely into do you think that this type of discussion forum, it's working well for the MSCT song, for the students on that particular programme. But what's the applicability for teaching EAP? Well, it's interesting because I've actually been using discussion forums um, for maybe, I don't know, at least 13 years or 14 years, something like that in my practice. So, um, I think they can be used for just a really wide variety of um, pedagogical purposes. Um, so if I think of one flow of activities, when I was at my former university, which is the University of Sussex, um, I used to teach IELTS writing to a group of pre-master students. And in order to sort of make that experience real, I'd take an IELTS writing task and post it and ask students to find at least one text which was related mm -hmm. to the theme of the, the task. The students would then all rush off and find something to read and contribute on the discussion forums and then they would read each other's um, sources. And so this would then be followed by a face-to-face -face, uh, seminar, but where the students would be able to draw on each other's sources for the seminar. And then at the next stage, the students would then go and write the um, IELTS task, so we task two, um, 
and then they would post back onto the forum and I always used to say right the first five people to post get feedback on their essays and then actually in a face-to-face -face session we would go through those five examples looking at what was good what was bad or maybe we would do some reformulation practice all sorts of course different ways to feedback on writing um, but I think that opportunity to invest at the beginning so that once students have gone off and found related sources or maybe taken the, the question off some way towards their discipline, mm. um, there was just a really high level of engagement from the students. And I think it goes back to this point about the ownership of the literature, that if students can feel they've had some sort of practice using it, so in that case, they summarised the key points and made, it re made those points relevant to the actual task that they were going to write. Um, I think that sort of prior engagement and having the time to do it, um, the whole act of actually writing a summary got the students to sort of reflect on the argument. They had an audience that was going to read. So um, I think it sort of provided maybe just a more real communication context. You're not just writing a summary because your teachers told you to. You're writing a summary because you know that it's going to be used in a seminar, for example, and it's going to help mm -hmm. um, your fellow students in the class. So that's one of my favourite ways of using um, an EAP forum. How about you? Um, I tend to use it for definitions. Um, and, you know, if we've come across something um, and perhaps it's a contested term in a discipline, for example, we might look at different ways that it's, you know, being used. So perhaps the first person would post up an answer and then somebody would come in and say no or then then somebody else would do another reading and say but this person agreed with the first person and you know yeah. and so it builds up over time which I think is quite a nice way to do it yeah and what about assigned um or assigning graded discussion boards now this is something that I don't know much about but you've got more experience on haven't you Jamie well it's just to say that um I think that you have to look at what your institution has chosen as settings for its VLE. So, for example, earlier on, we were showing you the example of Padlet and there the students can actually like posts, for example. Mm -hmm. And in many discussion forums, it's actually possible um, to do this. But I believe mm -hmm. in the case of our institution, this sort of function has been switched off. Wow. And so, um, I guess it just depends on what's available to you in your context. Obviously, students can sort of do a reply and they can sort of yeah. give a mark. But I think there's something quite nice about that instant click on a button, you know. So and that feels much more maybe familiar to mm -hmm. many of our learners because that's what they find in um, the sort of more social technologies that they use. Mm -hmm. um, but I think that's something that probably takes some careful thought. Yeah. Because it sort of changes, doesn't it? It changes the sort of relationship between mm. the students. Mm. Yeah. OK, well, I think in the interest of time, uh, we should end our Q&A session there, Janie. So thanks okay. for answering those questions from me. Um, and hopefully <laughs> our audience will have found <laughs> our replies helpful. So thank you very much, everyone. Thank you.